uh, class number 35 of the Golden Doves. Uh, there are two classes of reading. Semiotic reading is passive and serves to discover and decode the meaning of the text as intended by the author. So in semiotic reading, um, the emphasis is on discovering the, um, what did the author actually have in mind when he wrote that? And that's the, um, that's the job of the reader. The job of the reader is to use the words in the sentences to return to the mind of the author, right? That's a semiotic reading. So the words are there just to guide you to the mind of the author. Once you get to the mind of the author, the words are no longer um, important. Um, it also means that the reader is basically passive, right? Because the text, there is no interaction between the reader and the text, um, but rather the text is just a tool for the reader to get somewhere. As in Borges' Pierre Menard, author of Don Quixote. So um, it would make some sense, I think, to understand uh, what that sentence means. So first of all, uh, Jorge Luis Borges writes a story called uh, Pierre Menard, author of Don Quixote. Of course, uh, the book Don Quixote was written uh, by Cervantes, uh, I think uh, 16th century. Um, whereas Pierre Menard is um, a 20th century author. So how can Pierre Menard be the author of Don Quixote? So um, basically Pierre Menard is an author and he decides that he wants to write the book Don Quixote on his own. That just the understanding, he doesn't want to copy Cervantes that would be dishonest. Rather, he wants to become the person who wrote Don Quixote. He wants to spontaneously write Don Quixote by becoming Cervantes. So for example, he studies uh, 17th century uh, Spanish and he tries to have certain experiences that are similar to the experiences of, um, of Cervantes. And in this way, he hopes to spontaneously <laughs> write the book that Cervantes um, wrote. <clears throat> but just to be clear, he doesn't want to compose another Don Quixote. He wants to compose the Don Quixote. Um, later on, he changes his mind um, and he realizes that to write Don Quixote as Cervantes would be a mistake. So now he decides he wants to write Don Quixote as Pierre Menard. <laughs> and somehow he writes uh, two and a half chapters which coincidentally are word, are word for word identical to the original um, Don Quixote. And the narrator of the story, um, which is Borges or narrator slash narrator is saying how the new Don Quixote, the new book Don Quixote written by Pierre Menard is so much more superior than the Don Quixote, Don Quixote written by Cervantes. Mind you, they're identical word for word, except that Pierre Menard only wrote two and a half chapters. He didn't write the whole book, but it's superior. Um, uh, it's superior because when Cervantes wrote Don Quixote, um, it wasn't as deep, it wasn't as profound. Uh, for example, in Don Quixote, you had politics, uh, the politics of a heroic knights on the one hand, in contrast to bumbling farmer on the other hand. Whereas when Pierre Menard writes Don Quixote, he's looking back at a romantic past. I think you probably understand the point of the book. The point of the book is that um, if you get into this game of semiotic reading, which is to go into the mind of the author, you're actually indulging in intellectual impotence it'll produce absolutely nothing, right? Um, if your goal is to become Cervantes or to become Pierre Menard, who somehow writes Don Quixote on his own, all you ever will have is Don Quixote and there will be no wisdom 
and all knowledge becomes static. It just is as it is. And that's Aristotelian Greek ontological knowledge. So that's one class of reading. In semantic reading, and again, semantic reading means when the author, or the I'm sorry, when the writer, the author presents the book to the to the reader, and now the reader, he tries to understand the text. He doesn't try to understand the mind of the author because you'll never become Cervantes, as we learned from the story of Pierre Minard, right? So instead of trying to become the author, he tries to engage not with the author but with the text that you can do you can engage with the text and you can try to interpret the text and through the interpretation of the text you will reach certain knowledge semantic reading so in semantic reading Here it is. Every interpretation of a text is like a volume of Borges's The Library of Babel. So Borges wrote another story. The Library of Babel. In the Library of Babel, you have this infinite library, which never ends. And you go from one room to another room to another room. It goes up, to, up and down. There's stairs connecting the different rooms, and there's um, hallways connecting the different rooms, um, uh, horizontally, vertically stairways, horizontally hallways, and it never ends. And the library has every single possibility of every single book ever written. I have a certain understanding of that story, which I'm not going to um, discuss now, but the point that my father is making here is that the two stories, Pierre Menard, author of uh, Don Quixote and the Library of Babel, stand in opposition to each other. In Pierre Menard, the reader tries to enter the mind of the author and become the author. And the text is completely impotent. In the Library of Babel, there was every possible interpretation of any book. So you can have an infinite number of interpretations of any book. And then what do you have? you're again left with nothing. So wait. So that means that derasha is not a good thing because derasha means to interpret the text. And interpretation, you can have any interpretation. And if you can have any interpretation, then you're left with the Library of Babel where every text has different version of the text and a different version of the different version and every book has the antithesis of that book, which disproves the book. And then you have an antithesis of an antithesis. So you're left with no knowledge. So how is semantic reading somehow superior to semiotic reading? And the only answer is if you have the concept of berit, covenant. Hashem gave Am Yisrael the Torah Shabbat And we committed to adhere to the Torah Shabbat The Torah Shabbat cont contains the Mesavot. The Torah Shabbat contains the lenses through which interpretation is allowed. So the answer is not every interpretation is allowed, but rather interpretations that are within the rubric of the Le Mental, of the Torah Shabbat Peh, those interpretations are allowed. Now, will people try to interpret the text otherwise? Well, they may, and indeed they do. I mean, consider the Tikkun Olam movement that has been rampaging through American Jewry now for, what, a decade now. And it just becomes the Library of Babel, you know, Suddenly the Torah is really a manifesto of Antifa and Black Lives Matters, which it's not, I think you understand that. But you can turn the Torah into the library of Babel. 
So what's the solution? Berit, covenant. We have the misvot. We have Torah Shabbat Peh. Yes, you can interpret the text and you should interpret the text because otherwise you become Pierre Menard. But it's not a free for all because otherwise you become the library of Babel. So we have the Torah. We have Derashot within the Yagnidot, or there's a different number of um, rhetorical tools, but it's a limited number of rhetorical tools. It's not an infinite number of rhetorical tools. And that's why it can never become the library of Babel. It's Yag Midot, it's 26 Midot, depending on, on whose yeshiva you come from, but it's never infinite Midot. That's key because we are bound by the Torah Shebe'al Peh. And if you make a derasha that's outside the Torah Shebe'al Peh, that's a derasha Shel Tofi. Reading therefore, involves a crisis of choice. You have to make a Bechira. When you read a text, how do I interpret the text? So I'm I going to interpret the text as a manifesto for Tikkun Olam. It's a choice. Or do I interpret the text as, here's why we are loyal to the misvot. That's a crisis of choice. I can chas shalom decide to go off um, and outside the context of Torah Shabbat Peh. It's always a choice. It's called Bechira Chopshit. And Hashem entrusted the Torah with us. It was an act of trust. And he believes in us. He believes that ultimately we will make the right choice, but he will not impose that choice upon us. So you can become Pierre Menard and say, I want to find out and understand the mind of the author. I want to become, in this case, uh, God, okay? Get into the mind of God, right? And there was a person who did that. His name was Bil'am. Bil'am, the one who cursed the Jewish, wanted to curse the Jewish people. The Pasuk says, Ve'odea da'at elion. So he's the first Pierre Menard. He knows the mind of God, right? That's one possibility. The other possibility is um, the tikkun olam, the, all the various movements today, which they interpret the Torah as a text that requires interpretation, but they do it outside the context of berit, outside lamenta. And finally, you have the middle road. And the middle road is yes, interpret the text. No, you will not enter the mind of God. Of course you won't, but you have the text, engage with the text. But when you engage with the text, it's limited. So again, reading therefore involves, and by the way, this was on page two of Golden Dawns, I'm sorry, I didn't say that earlier. Reading therefore involves a crisis of choice and is a process that transforms the multiple meanings into a single significant text. And I just want to focus on that last sentence, is the process that transforms reading is the process that trans transforms the multiple meanings into, into a single significant text. So because when the reader reads the text and interprets the text, he in a sense becomes the writer of that interpretation, right? And by choosing an interpretation, you now exclude the library of Babel, right? So there are multiple possible interpretations. But now you create a text and that text excludes those other interpretations, right? It becomes definite. And um, I think this is a good place to stop.